Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing, and reside usually on the Erie campus. This week, in our series Undivided, we sit down with Pastor John Boyle, the executive pastor of Calvary Bible Church. We're going to have a great discussion, but before we get there, do me a huge favor. Visit calvarybible.com, stay connected, get connected. Also, Download the Church Center app. Let us know how we can be praying for you. We love to be a praying church. All right, let's jump into the conversation. John, thanks for sitting down with us today. Thanks for having me, Jay. So fun that you're in the booth. I'm glad to be here. How's the fall unfolded for you? It's been great. Yeah? It's a good time of year, and you know it's fun to have all the activities that are going, kicked off, and rolling. Yeah. These days you have a junior in your house. I do, and a driver. Wow. Yeah, which is a whole new world. Yes. It's amazing. How often are you going to find my friends to see her location? You know what? She is uh, very responsible yeah. and a cautious driver, so I'm I'm not concerned mm-hmm. about her. And there's this thing now they have on the phones where they can like do a check-in when they leave somewhere, and then it sends you... A little text that they're leaving and then it tells you what time they're going to be home so yeah. it's it's helpful that is helpful what is it being in the passenger seat going down the road What's oh that, like? i mean that's that was the that was harder when she was getting her permit right and now it's you know not a big deal right. so i have it's like i have a chauffeur it's very nice <laughs> you sit in the back and read a paper yeah <laughs> i ask her not to speak to me while we drive <laughs> That's great. Well, for those who don't know, John Boyle is the executive pastor of Calvary Bible Church. It's good to be sitting down with you today. And you preach. Can I tell you I'm a little uncomfortable, though? Why? Well, like you shaved your face. I did. (laughs) And I'm not really sure who I'm looking at, to be honest with you. People on this week's weekly are going to be very confused of why my face is so clean. Yeah, it's weird. Well, we had men's retreat this last week. Mm Mm-hmm. And I have a good friend who I reluctantly let him talk me into something, and that is to shave for a mustache at men's retreat. And then you shaved the rest of your face. Yeah, because I'm not going to live with a mustache going into the week. I don't think I've... Have I ever seen you without a beard? No, it's been 12 years since anyone has seen this chin. <laughs> it's 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 very awkward. It is very. My kids... Every night my son is praying for the beard to go back faster. They ask who you are when you come in the That's, house. You know, they're Mommy, there's a strange <laughs> man in our home. Call the police. It, yes. And unfortunately, our, my producer Mark Wicks got a photo of this picture of the mustache and actually posted it to the Calvary socials over the weekend. Unfortunately. Seems like a good choice. I did not think about the implications of me being in front and that happening. I saw a picture before. of it. I thought it was a nice looking mustache. Thank you. Yeah. I look like uh, a fireman or the guy from uh, Rescue Rangers, the Monty, wasn't his name or something? I don't Bell know. Bell Mouse. I don't know. It's the 80s, 90s reference. Oh. The producer will find. Okay. But yes, it's been interesting. And I remember why I have a beard. So you will now embark on growing it again? Yes. How long will it take you to get it to an, a length that you're satisfied with? I'm hoping it's shorter than longer. For like, that, is this those like days. a month? Um, probably less. Oh, good. Less than a month. All right. Yeah. How about we don't see each other until it's back to that <laughs> proper length, and then I'll feel less awkward. No doubt. Okay. No doubt. Actually, it's been interesting with my friends. They're like, "Oh, I can actually see you and your kids now." Oh, because uh-huh. that's been hard for them jacob doesn't have a beard yet no okay but they keep praying for that to grow back faster really fast Mm. super cute after we wrap up praying they usually add addition (laughs) to the prayer (laughs) addendum lord (laughs) help dad Mm. anyways we sit down with first corinthians in the series undivided Mm -hmm. and what have been some of your key takeaways over the weeks that we've been journeying through the series Oh, I think just how committed Paul is to the unity of the church in Corinth and the reminder for us personally of how important it is that we're undivided. And, 
you know, the way in which little squabbles, factions that were developing in the first century in the church in Corinth can lead to division and how, you know, every church sort of has to guard against that. And uh, yeah, I think that's a helpful reminder for us even in our day too. Yeah, as you're preparing to preach over the last couple of weeks, what's been on your heart with or what has been surprising to you about Paul's conversation and this unity about undivided was like, oh, I didn't know he was talking about this or, you know, what stuck out to you? Uh, you know, because we were in the final verses of chapter four this past weekend, that comes right on the heels of those, you know, seven or eight verses that are like super mean, mm -hmm. sarcastic. Sarcasm, yes. And that's that's just interesting to me. And I've wondered like, you know, is he shining a mirror on some of the ways that the, uh, the folks he calls uh, later in the chapter arrogant, the ways they were speaking, you know, to each other. Right. Um, you know, cause I, I've heard people occasionally justify their biting sarcasm by saying, you know, Paul is sarcastic, so it's okay. Mm -hmm. But you notice when you, you know, read the verses we were in on Sunday that, uh, yeah, he's, he's sarcastic in those verses, but he does it in the context of love and of trying to build them up, not, you know, beat them down and not be critical for the sake of being critical, but because he cares and he wants them again to be undivided. Mm -hmm. I think that was really surprising for me because I preached the first half of four last week and I was really surprised of that mechanism he used of sarcasm. Yeah. And I didn't know what category to ever put it in right. as I prepared to preach. I was like, it's very strange that this is actually in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because it's very, there's not another section like this yeah. through all of Scripture. Yeah. And so I was very disoriented yeah. by that. So it's interesting you say that he does it in love or he does it in love to, for a mirror for them. Maybe it's the language they were using for totally. themselves. I know. And he's that he's just sort of bringing back up. Right. And showing him how ridiculous it is to yeah. speak to each other in that way. How hard do you think it would have been to be a faithful follower of Jesus in Corinth? Man, I mean, you know, in the the context they're in of, you know, I mean, we've talked about it a lot at the Boulder campus. It's not unlike the city that we live in, in Boulder in right. particular, where it's like, you know, highly educated, influential, uh, overly sexualized, like all these things that are actually uh, issues that we grapple with and deal with in our day today too. So yeah. um, I, I was thinking about how different it would have been in Corinth because they don't have the blessing that we have of like 2,000 years of church history. Yes, totally. You know, like they're building this thing from scratch and trying to figure out together what the church is going to look like. And it's a totally new idea to them. And so I think that would have made it especially hard, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, Paul wrote uh, lots of letters to them mm -hmm. and, you know, stayed with them for so long and sent Timothy there. And he really cared about building a, a healthy church where Christ was exalted and people followed him and they focused on the right things and cared for each other and, you know, uh, walked with Jesus together. I, I think it would have been really hard because you're making it up. And all the, you know, different, like the first century is way different than our day, obviously. Yeah. Different culture. I, I think that's a really wise comment that no one has made reference to in the podcast over the weeks is that they don't have church history or a template to what this looks like mm -hmm. or the working out of this theological practice for 2000 years. And we should give them a lot of grace for that because they're the beginning of right. what the church will look like. Totally. That's, su that's super interesting, John. I really like that. In verse 14, we picking up in your message, you know, he says, I do not write things to make you ashamed, mm -hmm. but to admonish. Would you notice between those two words that, um, really helped us understand how he's used sarcasm. You've talked about it, I think, a little bit, but ashamed is like a really big word there. Yeah. And admonish is a really big, strong word as well. 
Yeah, the way I thought about it, another way you could say that is, I'm not trying to humiliate you. I'm trying to help you. Ooh, that's you know? good. Yeah. And I th- I think that's, again, it's right on the heels of those sarcastic words. And I think most of the time when people are sarcastic in our day in a way that's totally unhelpful yes, is they are trying to humiliate another person. Yes. And they're trying to make themselves look better. They're trying to make a cheap joke at somebody else's expense. They're really trying to put someone down. And I think this is his heart because he calls them later in that verse, my beloved children. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to humiliate you. Right. And I think these verses are a really good model of like how we should handle conflict in the church when there are issues. Yes. I don't know that the best thing is to send a sarcastic email to somebody. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't totally. recommend that. But I would recommend like, you know, coming at it with a heart of love and a, a desire to help other people, you know. And I think too often um, when division does occur, it's because pride gets in the way yep. or the, the heart is not to help, but it's to hurt or uh, to make someone look bad or to win an argument you know, and Paul's heart is one of love. He wants to help him. And, you know, he uses some stern language, but then I think he resolves it with love and affection for them. Right. He uses the word father. He's fathered them in the gospel. Mm -hmm. In your reflections, how does this idea of fathering help you in pastoral life? How does it help you with your own father Mm -hmm. who you lost tragically? Like, what are the ideas that came to your head when you were thinking about Paul's use of father? Yeah. Oh, we talked in Boulder about how, you know, there's lots of metaphors for the church in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And one of the more common ones is the church is a family. And that's the language that Paul's using here. Right. Um, And so we all have to sort of set aside our own personal experiences with our fathers, which can help or hurt. Yes. In my case, I think my example of a father was really helpful in this case because my dad was loving. He was a great example for me. He's the kind of man that I would like to be as a husband and a father or father and a follower of Jesus, all those things. So I, I'm really blessed to have had a wonderful uh, model of a father. Um, and so in that case, I think I'm helped to see how Paul's affection for the followers of Jesus in Corinth is one of like fatherly love, you know, and the importance of a mother and a father in the life of children in the family unit is like, they're the most important influential voice. Right. And I don't think what Paul's doing here is trying to be authoritative or you have to listen to me cause I'm your spiritual father. But I think he's just trying to communicate to them his affection for them in the context of sort of reprimanding them. Right. Let's go a little further into this idea of fathering. Do you think it's important for us to have spiritual fathers and mothers? Oh my gosh. In our faith? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I've had, I was reflecting this week too on so many, uh, men and women who have been examples to me in my life of what it means to follow Jesus. And that's one of my favorite things about our church Right, is there are so many people who have been following Jesus longer than I have that I've been able to be around and learn from and watch and see them model what it means to follow Jesus. Right. And I mean, I could just like, I don't even know how many names I could list off right. of people who have been an example to me. And I think, you know, uh, the Psalms say one generation shall uh, declare your mighty acts to another. Yeah. You know, like that's we love that Psalm. That's we part of that like, song. that's just part of, uh, what a church is meant to be mm-hmm. is that there are generations mm-hmm. and there's generations at Calvary. And when you're part of a church that's been around for 135 years, you know, there's people who've been here a long time and people who are new. Right. And that's like a strength of ours yeah. that we can, you know, model what it means to follow Jesus to people who are younger. Yeah. For someone who doesn't have a spiritual father or mother, mm-hmm. how do you go about getting them? Well, I think that's where you have to jump in and find connection points. I think there's so many ways that can happen. Right. Like we have cool mentoring programs that are great ways. You can just say, I'd like a mentor. Right. 
I think you can do that, you know, in like men's and women's Bible studies mm-hmm. in life groups. Um, just by serving at the church, you're going to bump into and meet people and be able to serve alongside them and develop relationships. I mean, that those, those things to be fair, do take time, take a long you know? time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the benefits of just saying, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get connected with people and then, you know, take advantage of opportunities when people invite you into that kind of relationship. You know, I'm thinking of a friend I know who was invited into, Hey, can, you know, you want to get together and study the Bible with me by an older man? Like, that's awesome. Right. You know, and you say, yes, like that might be a new experience for me, but I'm going to try that and see what comes of it. Yeah. You know, that's really good. I think it takes some humility and patience, yeah. prayerful patience, totally. asking the Lord to provide someone like that in your life mm-hmm. and then having the humility to, because it's not easy because most of my spiritual fathers and mothers, those individuals who really have guided me in seasons, they are weren't always agreeing with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were always, they were pressing me. Right. Paul's not agreeing with his spiritual children. Right. Right. Yeah. And so it takes a lot of humility to say, okay, what they're saying is true. Yeah. How does that affect me? Yeah. That's hard. What I need to do. And it's interesting you say it takes humility. I mean, the, one of the things that Paul calls out in these verses is the arrogance of some of the people in Corinth. Yeah, totally. And like, man, that is just a stumbling block to having those kinds of relationships is arrogance. And it does take deep, deep humility right? on both sides of like, I'm willing to pour my life out for another person and for the, for sort of the people who are younger in the faith, a humility and a desire and a willingness to learn. Mm-hmm. But man, when you say like, I don't have this thing totally figured out and no one does. And you know, that's the other thing about spiritual mothers and fathers. They're not perfect. No. And you can't expect them to be. They're going to have flaws and weaknesses. Yep. And uh, the best ones are going to admit that to you. Right. Um, but when when you're willing to say, you know, I, I want to learn from other people and that's the kind of person I could learn from, mm-hmm. you know, I, th- I think you just you grow because of that. Yeah. I think it's really important for the people of Calvary to understand that the antithesis of arrogance is pride. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make sure we have those things in check Mm -hmm. when we talk about coming under authority of like a father or mother and the humility to put our lives, submit our lives in them and and let them listen and learn. Yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting. Okay. So, he uses this word, and this is one of the famous lines in verse 16. He says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Yeah. It's interesting that he doesn't say, just be imitators of Christ. Yeah. And he really points to himself as the example. Yeah. And that's a famous verse for Paul. Right. It's a really famous verse for Paul. How does, why do you think he uses imitators of me more than imitators of Christ? Well, I, I think one thing we have to do is not just take one verse of Paul's yeah. writing and say that's the only thing he says like later in first Corinthians, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Right. So I think you have to have all that, all of his writing in your mind to understand exactly what he's saying. Um, but clearly I think it's just learned experience. Again, go back to the like family model here. What, what he says before that is in verse 15, you have countless guides in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. And he's talking about this common reality in first century Greco-Roman culture where there were uh, these folks who were kind of like nannies or au pairs that were a part of the household that would help raise the children to maturity. And the, the word we've translated that is guides. And he's doing a comparison between those kinds of people who are not the parents of the family Right. But essentially, and this is this isn't exactly what happens, but you're sort of outsourcing some of your parenting when you bring a nanny in, right? And right. especially when you're trying to teach moral character to kids. But he makes a comparison between that kind of person, like a nanny or a babysitter or an au pair, is just not the same as a father or a mother. And and I think the point he's making is in the family unit and then also in the church family, the most important person is like the actual father-mother 
in the life of a child. Right. They're going to have the deepest influence, right? And he's saying, I'm your spiritual father. And he knows he's one of the most influential people in their lives. And he wants them to follow him. So I, I think... I think when he says be an imitator of me, it's in the context of you need to imitate your father. Right. I'm your spiritual father, as opposed to these other people who have been less influential in your life. Um, and I think our learned experience is that's just the way it works in life. Like I'm sure you have mannerisms from your parents. I do too. This is the same face as my father. There you go. You're looking at. Right. Yeah. And like you know, you're, you're naturally going to conduct yourself in a way that is sort of mimics your parents, could, right. you know, they're influential in your life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you want to mimic the people who have deep and abiding faith in Jesus. Most of all, mm -hmm. I mean, you think about our world today, there are so many guides you could follow oh, totally. in the Christian world. And that's a, that's a benefit. Like I think I've benefited from listening to, you know, pastors who preach at a church somewhere else in the world that I've never met before. Right. And I don't have a personal relationship with them and they've benefited me, but that's not the same as like my pastor mm -hmm. that I get to live life with and see and watch and learn how they conduct themselves. Yeah. You know, like my relationship personally with Tom is way more than just what I've learned from him when he's, preached on Sundays and I've listened to him, although I've learned a ton there. Right. It's like watching him live his life mm -hmm. and learning from him in the way that he conducts himself. You know, that's just more valuable than like listening to someone that you've never met. You don't get to see how they live. Yeah. And I think that's what Paul's saying. You've watched me live. I lived with you for what he was in Corinth for like 18 months, 18 months. Yeah. yeah. So they know him. Right. They watched him follow Jesus and, uh, He's saying, you know, continue to follow me. I think you're making a really great case for the local church as well. And I'm, I, I'm like you. I've benefited from international pastors, pastors who somehow I got connected to, listening to them preach, have benefited from them. However, there's nothing that can supplement you being under the care of someone who is local yeah. and knowing them and knowing their life. And that's the danger of this celebrity culture we have in pastoral life right now. Yeah. We, we've got to be around these people. And I also, I, I don't want to say that like the, the only people we learn from are pastors. Right. Like that, that was just an example in my life. And to be clear, the people that I've talked about that have also been spiritual fathers and mothers in my life are not pastors. Many that, of them are not. And I've learned so much from them too, primarily of watching them. Right. You know, <laughs> Yeah. Watching them live their life, watching them raise kids, watching them be grandparents, watching them serve at the church in their particular ministry and admire the way that they've done that. And yeah, like when you're with people and relationally connected to them, it's just so much better than like, well, I'm just going to listen to someone I've never met talk about how to raise kids. That can be beneficial, right? but it's not as beneficial as like witnessing someone do it yeah. and learn in that way. It's a good reminder that if we have kids in our, under our roofs still or grandkids or we're serving with kids, they're watching us. Yeah, totally. And they learn more from what we do than what we say. Yeah. Such What's a, the famous quote? You're going to know this and I'm... Uh, I have a producer that tells me famous quotes. Really? Yeah. Mark Wicks. He, does he go everywhere with you? In the weekly he does. Oh, great. Yeah. What's the one, you know... Uh, uh, preach the gospel and use words when necessary or something like that. Oh yeah. It's a uh, brother. Uh, it's, uh, it's Francis of Assisi. Okay. Yeah. Are you a hundred percent confident about that? I'm pretty, I'm almost a hundred percent confident. Do you need that. to ask your producer to check that? He's, he's doing it right now. He'll and then what say. happens when does he text you? How no, do he'll just let me know right all way or he'll send me an article later that I was wrong. Or he'll edit this and no. replace it. He's well, kind. anyway, but you know, it's like that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. That like, of course, you have to preach the gospel with words, right? But like, our actions matter. The way oh. we conduct ourselves is really important. Oh, no doubt. And if you read the epistle here, and then you read like the epistle First John, it's like important that we yeah. make sure we those both are congruent to yeah. together. Okay, so 
he sends Timothy, which if you read Acts, Timothy's in quite a few places with Paul yeah. throughout the journeys. Mm-hmm. And then he's in Ephesus when we come into First and Second Timothy, and now he's in Corinth here. Okay. I mean, Timothy must have been just an incredible help to Paul yeah. in these ministry years. Absolutely. What sticks out to you when he says, I sent you Timothy in this and with the Church of Corinth? Timothy always goes to churches that are in trouble. Yeah. It seems like. Right. But obviously he's, uh, you know, deeply trusted by Paul. Yep. It, it reminds me of, of this uh, uh, illustration I used on Sunday. Um, so Howard Hendricks, who was a, you know, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, trained a ton of pastors. Um, he said every Christian should have three kinds of relationships in their life. Have you ever heard this? No. Oh, this is great. Uh, you... You should have a Paul, someone who's an older person who models Jesus for you. That's like your spiritual mother or father. You know, they've walked down the road before you. They're not perfect, but like you, you can follow after them. Then you need a Barnabas who's like a soul brother or sister who's like with you in the journey. Right, you know, an encourager. Yeah, just a, they're yeah. with you, who's, who knows you, you can be vulnerable with. Like right. they're not impressed by you. They'll call you out. They'll ask you how you're doing in your life. And then you need a Timothy, someone who's younger that you're pouring into and mentoring and praying for and encouraging and developing. That's so and like good. every person who follows Jesus needs those three kinds of relationships. Yeah. And uh, so that model with Paul of just seeing how from the earliest days, like he's empowering young leaders, yep. he's training them up. He's sending them out to do real ministry work. It's not like Paul always comes to the rescue, right? Right. Like he sends Timothy and he coached Timothy and he gave him advice and he mentored him and he trained him up and then he released him to ministry. And that's how the church continues. If Paul had done it all on his own, like maybe the church doesn't continue after the first century, right? but he trained up men and women like Timothy to be able to continue the work of the ministry elsewhere. That's such a great reminder for us, John. I'm really thankful for that. My producer did come through and said mm. that that quote is misattributed, misplaced to uh, Francis of Assisi. Someone just made it up. It's in their, yeah, it's in their rule of life, though. Okay, well, whatever. Franciscans. It's, it's valuable. It is valuable. It's a really Good. valuable quote. Have you ever had the producer on the show? Um, he's actually led the show once before. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. He stepped in for me one time. You were sick or something? I don't remember what was going on, but okay. yeah. Well, you, maybe there. you should have him as a Do you know our producer shows up at the end of every preach now at, on the website to close out the... Yeah, I've seen that. It's really nice. Did you know he's Canadian? We definitely know he's Canadian. Okay. It's, <laughs> yes. It's, it's very international, the weekly. Very international. Yeah. Okay, so verse 20, I love this phrase. That Paul uses for the kingdom of God does not mm. consist in talk, but in power. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about that, right? Like, so often we have a talking faith. We talk about the faith. Right. But reality is that that talk is rooted in something more powerful than Oh, that. yeah. Absolutely. What's your reflections on power here? Oh, man. Well, you know, this is the evidence of real genuine faith is like the fruit of the Holy spirit in the life of a believer. And in this context where people are arguing and, you know, developing factions over, Oh, I'm better than you because I follow Apollos or I'm better than you because I follow Paul, whatever. And then in the, in the context of the first century where like these, you know, sort of like Ted talk, eloquent wisdom things were like highly valued and you'd listen to these things that, you know, people were impressed because someone spoke so nicely. Yeah. But it it's like bluster. It's like fluff and not filled with uh any anything of true value. You know, you think about what needs to happen in the ministries of a church for it to be effective. It's not just like, oh, we came and listened to a really nice talk on Sunday. No, right. like we want the Holy Spirit to be active in the room that we're in and that he is the one who Uh, brings dead people to life and illuminates the scripture in the heart of the believer and convicts people of sin. And that that's what we want to experience. And we want to experience that throughout our church. And we want to be reminded that as followers of Jesus, yeah, this isn't just 
some intellectual thing that we just talk about or read and that's it. But like the power of the Holy Spirit is manifest in our prayer life, in our life of service, in our life of Bible reading, in our, in our relational life as we meet together and, and encourage one another and notice ways that like we need to call each other out or that, you know, we sense that God's calling someone to something and, you know, we share that with them because the Holy Spirit's working in our hearts. And, you know, that's what the kingdom of God is, a, is about, that there's tangible evidence that God is at work. And it's not just that people are, you know, totally talking. It's about a man being raised from the dead. Right. By the power of God. By the power of God. And isn't it amazing that the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in in the heart of every believer. That's, it's incredible news. Like, and that has implications for the way we live our life and the confidence that we have when we minister or when we have to care for someone who's deeply hurting or when we're praying, you know? Right. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective because if you are righteous, if you've been made righteous by Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you and you, you can be confident that your prayers are powerful and effective. John, I think that's a great place to leave us off this week. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks for having me, Jay. Well, as we're reminded by John, as he points us to Christ, that you, people of Calvary, live in a special, special reality where the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is in you. May we continue to be faithful to that process. May we continue to pray, pray for that process. And look to the scriptures as we become imitators for others, just as Paul was an imitator for the people of Corinth. All right. Do me a favor. Like always, go to calvarybible.com. Click your campus. Find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. We want you to stay connected. Get connected by always going to calvarybible.com. And as well, as you can always leave us a question if you're interested uh, on our YouTube channel. We read those. We would love to answer any question you have about the book of first corinthians hey just a heads up parents if you have young kids or kids not ready for this conversation chapter five this week you might want to read it ahead you actually need to read it ahead like every week but read chapter five and discern if your kids are ready for that conversation that's coming this sunday at calvary we love you talk to you soon thanks for tuning in